Morning, morning. Ohio. Hello. So thank you all for coming out on a Friday morning with possible jet lag and hangovers um, to hear us talk to you today about crafting collective creativity. Really excited to be here. Hajimimashite. <laughs> so we're from Monopol. And we call ourselves a brand of collective creativity. So Monopo is a creative agency based in Tokyo, found by two band boys in 2011. Today, we are a family of 30 people with a branch in London. By the way, so I am Asako, that one. Um, so I'm a creative producer and a planner at Monopo. I was born in Tokyo, uh, grew up in France, and then came back to Osaka, started in Kyoto and Bordeaux, and then since four years ago, I live in Tokyo. She's also just recently started a DJ collective for her love for techno as you can and see. is the lead singer of the Monopole band. Yes, we have a Monopole band, yep. bookings available, <laughs> weddings, funerals, karaoke sessions. Well, <laughs> enough about me. <laughs> so I'm Georgie, by the way. I'm, I'm producer and the global account director at Monopole. Um, I born, was born in the UK. I grew up, grew up in South Africa and have lived in Japan for the last four and a half years. Um, oh. You gonna say something about me? Yeah, <laughs> I have a lot to say about her. About so that, she's right. super talented. I mean, you can hear from her voice. She has beautiful voice, does voiceover work. Like she was once the voice of a Chanel vending machine, am I right? In Ginza, how fancy is that? <laughs> um, also this video, uh, this photo of her, it comes from a J-pop music video. She was like the heartbreaking badass boyfriend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyways, as you might have already understood, we are Two producers, yes, not the most sexy creative role in the creative process. But hey, we're here to prove you wrong. Because at Monopo, by practicing collective creativity, we are so creative. And we're going to show you how. So maybe let's start by defining what is collective creativity, at least to us. Uh, have you thought about the first time that you came across a Bloody Mary? So what is vodka doing in the same glass as Tabasco, tomato juice, and lemon? Well, essentially, it's a mix of very interesting ingredients. So a Bloody Mary is a mix of strong ingredients quick piece, uh, that served in the right glass and drunk by many people. Collective creativity is also a group of bunch of individuals that come together in a space and, uh, and have a stage to shine on and, involve, and shared with many people as well. So basically, a Bloody Mary and a collective creativity come together by bringing individual um, and diverse elements together to create something essentially new. So what we do here as producers is that we're basically the bartenders. We make the Bloody Mary taste like how we taste. So what we do is we pick the ingredients and shake up the mix. So how to be a good bartender, step one, you got to know your ingredients. Because by focusing on each ingredient, producers design projects. And when I talk about the ingredients, you shouldn't forget about us producers as part of the ingredients. So I just said that I'm also an ingredient. Let's give it a flavor. Maybe sake, yeah. splash of champagne, a yeah. bit of yuzu on the side. That sounds fancy. I like that. So I'd say, you know, considering my Japanese background with a French-influenced value, uh, I guess I can say that I bring in to project a sake champagne mixture flavor. Um, so in other, in other words, I'm a Japanese person with an international perspective. And there's a perfect project where I could just sprinkle my flavor all over, which is Wasso. So Wasso is a brand from Shiseido. Shiseido as you may or you may not know, uh, is a Japanese beauty brand. And they, their la latest brand, what, which was launched, is called Shiseido. Uh, they base their skincare philosophy um, to the Japanese culinary way of thinking of less is more. It's really playful, it's really fun. Uh, it's for younger generations, and they, all their ingredients are inspired by Japanese ingredients, so, such as that's how wasabi actually looks like. Did you guys know? Yeah, daikon it feels really good on your face, surprisingly. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, uh, their brief, 
when they first came to us, they came to us saying, so we have a lot to re-communicate to our consumers. Uh, we want to re-communicate our brand philosophy, uh, Japanese background and cultures and values, product benefit. How do we do all that? And especially it was hard or challenging because their target audience is Gen Z, which is a pure digital generation. So, you know, we can't be um, too descriptive. We can't write a lot because our main focus was Instagram. So how can we visually uh, quickly communicate this idea? So we asked ourselves a different question. We asked ourselves, how can we make a Japanese skincare philosophy attractive to Gen Z? So we tackled this challenge by making it an attractive campaign that is instantly understandable by bringing out fresh Japanese image. And it looked like this. So what I brought in as an ingredient is my Japanese-ness, but I know really well how people see Japan, what people know about Japan, the stereotypes. And therefore, it's really frustrating for me sometimes. I'm like, guys, you only know the surface. So for example, this card game, I brought it in because this is an amazing, perfect way to communicate those ingredient product relation just by visual. We don't need to explain. So this is wasabi. It actually looks like this. It only looks like the green pasted thing, you know, after grating it. No, this is really visual, instant, efficient. Another thing that I wanted to really incorporate is to push uh, the beauty standard. So Japanese beauty standard is really singular. Um, even as Japanese people in Japanese culture, we don't really push the diversity of it. Even though the people who actually are in Japan um, in the beauty scene, they're really diverse. The two girls in the video, um, they are half Japanese, half Ugandan, half Japanese, half Australian. And their um, characteristics such as darker skin, freckles, positive body image, uh, curly hair, it's not really projected in the beauty industry. So as a person who cares about projecting a more authentic Japanese image and challenging beauty standards, I brought in a new ingredient to the project by bringing in my own ingredient. So it's important to be yourself, of course, but it's also important when you're working to have a space that people can be as creative as possible. So having these ingredients in the right glass. You're not going to be putting a Bloody Mary in a shot glass or a martini, or, I mean, you could. We'll see what it's like. Mm. Um, but as a producer or as a project leader, I see that my contribution is especially in the way that we guide leadership. So, you know, micromanaging and uh, uh, other ways of, of working with creatives is not necessarily the way to to create collective creativity. I come from a TV and video production background where uh, we, I wasn't even in the same studio as the creatives. Um, in fact, when the production process starts, we, the, the creative is already done and dusted and in a script. And I felt like it's really hard to sell and believe in something that I wasn't even included in the creative process or actually know where it's coming from. But since coming to Monopo and uh, some uh, other experiences, I felt that actually the way that you lead a project has to be a lot more integrated. And getting those ingredients together, getting people talking, brainstorming, and sharing those ideas are extremely important to the creative process. So uh, Linda A. Hill, who wrote about collective genius, talks about how leaders should set the stage for something. So uh, essentially, I want to be able to get ingredients together, but also allow them an opportunity to share these ideas and then make something out of it. Um, so I have an example of where I really had to challenge myself to not do micromanagement, to kind of put those risk aversions aside. Because as a producer, you know, we've got to manage budget, time, and a lot of things on us. So it's obviously easier to take the safer way out. But micromanaging doesn't do anyone any good. And in fact, there was a project that I have in mind where I really felt that I could target collective creativity and give more opportunities for creative input. So um, we worked on a uh, campaign for Canada Goose. It was the first time that they were doing a campaign outside of uh, Northern America, and it was for a rain jacket. So the brief was kind of, uh, you know, the, the classic campaign deliverables, uh, content, key visuals, copy, et cetera. Um, and also very much had to be to do with Japan and Japan's relationship with rain. Um, so quite a nice brief that we had to start off with, but um, a lot was on the stake for us. 
So we decided to include an artist called, um, some artists involved as well. But uh, let me just show you a little bit of insight into the campaign itself. So this was one of the, de the deliverables was the film. So we wanted to shoot rain in Japan and went to Wakayama, which is the rainiest part of Japan, although it actually didn't rain much at all mm -hmm. when we shot. Uh, <laughs> um, and you'll, here's, you see two artists. So Aoi Yamaguchi, she's a world-renowned calligrapher, and we wanted her to interpret our concept of different words for rain in Japanese. Um, then we have Koichi Okamoto, who is a sound, uh, sound designer slash product designer slash artistic genius. And basically, we had these two minds that we brought together, and we wanted to see um, how they would interpret our concept. So our concept was basically, in, so in English, we have about, what, three different words for rain. Rain, drizzle, don't go outside. In Japanese, there's over 50 different words to explain this. We pushed it, it really far. And uh, mm -hmm. really, like, emotional connections as well. So we found the perfect way to explain our concept, which is 50 different words for rain. But now, I want to just go back before all this kind of Oh, we are right at the uh, beginning of the campaign, and also talk about how, um, you know, when we have the first meeting um, with a client, we have a lot on stake, and we invited Okamoto-san to be part of it because he would be making the sound um, from scratch uh, for the soundtrack of the film. But, um, you know, and I, I, the safest way was that myself and the creative director, we would lead the whole conversation. We would make sure that everything was presented exactly as it was meant to be and that nothing could be threatening our image as a brand. But Okamoto-san was just someone that I really wanted to hear his interpretation of the concept because he could just translate it into his and add his own Tabasco. So fast forward to... This is an exhibition we did at Milan Design Week last year. So this was an interpretation of the campaign, but in an immersive experience. This was not a part of our brief. In fact, it was not part of the budget, it was not part of the deliverables. This came out of Okamoto-san's interpretation of our concept for the campaign. And as you see, the 50 different words for rain were painted on a wall. He had this idea of using hydrochromic ink, which is a, a special substance that when you paint over something and then splash it with water, it becomes invisible. So, okay, so let's get all these different words for rain that's covered in hydrochromic ink. And then he wanted to also use this to experience the sound of rain, but not by just listening to rain, by actually being immersed in it without being wet. So he put, wanted to put directional speakers um, above an audience, an open-air space, so that people, once they're in a different part of the space, could hear a different sound for rain. So this was all great, all good ideas, um, and we thought, okay, we've got to somehow try to make this work, and adding a bit more ingredients to the mix. So one of our senior uh, designers, he had an amazing idea to make the experience a bit more immersive, as well as how do we get people in Milan to actually understand all the kanji on the wall? So we came up with a web-based app, an AR app, so that people could translate the words in real time. And there were other ingredients that just kept being added to the mix that eventually created a project out of nothing. So this took the campaign to a whole nother level. I mean, it gained the brand si over 60 million impressions in just a few days, and also launched the brand into the Italian fashion market, which is already crowded and has a lot of um, you know, locally born brands. So this is an example for me where I was really able to work with some amazing ingredients and also able to challenge the client um, and the brand to take things a little bit further and see how collective creativity can make something essentially new. So now that you picked your ingredient, shake it up, you got the light, right glass, you got to drink it. So um, we have a perfect platform for that at Monopole. We have a platform called Powered by Tokyo, which is our in-house project, where we try to showcase the more authentic Tokyo stories. So we would use editorial contents, films, interviews, etc., etc., and we put it on our platform. So producers decide which ingredients should be in the mix, right? And then we think that, in other words, uh, we curate the creative minds. So I have a background, I come from a background of history of art. And what learning history of art taught me is that curation is so important. You know, artists are completely fine on their own. They can create art, show them, sell them, but 
there's, you, we can't deny the power of curation because by putting them together, you can even strengthen it even more. So as a producer, I learned about how this curative work can be powerful, powerful at Powered by Tokyo. So I joined Monopo at first as a producer at Powered by Tokyo, and it was really exciting. It's a true collaborative work between us, Monopo, and our community. And since this is a passion project, creators come to us with stories to tell. They want to show this, they want to tell that story. And we also have stories that we want to, to, to tell. So we share those ingredients with each other, we try new mix, and then eventually, super unique mixes and results come out of it. By the way, you guys know how neons are made? Have you ever seen it? Tokyo is really iconic for its neon landscape, right? So I made a documentary about a neon shokunin, or craftsman. And it looked like this. So this is a pure invention uh, of this creation of mine. because So this was in collaboration with Pen Magazine, a Japanese magazine that launched their international website. So they wanted to have a cool Japanese content that can talk to the international audience in an edgy manner to show the modern side of Tokyo. So basically what they thought, what they had in mind initially was, okay, let's, cool, let's shoot like katana swordsmith or sushi shokunin in a cooler way. But I thought, we know what they do, so maybe, maybe we should show something new. So instead of showing the traditional sushi craftsman, um, ceramic shokunin, I chose to show the more modern side of Tokyo. However, what's interesting about this guy is that he's so influenced about American culture, and his little studio is so interesting, but his spirit, his way of thinking, his philosophy is a true shokunin spirit. So this was um, thanks to our curation and sharing efforts of ideas that this unique idea and story was born. So we talk about understanding these ingredients, and I think it even goes on to a deeper level than that. Um, we think that there's so much more than behind the title, so whilst we, we wear our titles with pride, we do think there's many layers behind it, and often at Monopole, we don't really see each other as titles, it's more about the people and the ingredients in that. So I don't know if you've noticed, but we're actually friends. Yep. <laughs> um, we hang out a lot, and that goes for also a lot of other members at Monopo and in our community. So we mm -hmm. actually know each other, <laughs> <Over there>. um, <laughs> which means that we know them as individuals and that we understand that as bartenders, we really want to know what lies beneath that ingredient and see how that personality can come into a project. So empowering individu individuality um, can innovate our organization and has a lot of the, a lot of the growth of Monopo has also been because of individuals' initiatives. Um, we even had a, a student uh, who came in as an intern and realized that our back-end system was not that great. He came in and redesigned everything. And this is a guy that still hasn't graduated. Mm -hmm. Everybody's initiative has some input and really can have an, an impact on our organization. Our CTO, CEO, co-founder, he's really <laughs> interested in uh, technology and music. So it came together with a concept of squeeze music, where you get to taste what music feels, uh, the mood that music evokes. So maybe, have you ever wondered what jazz might taste like? Squeeze music gives that kind of opportunity. And these kind of projects, um, you can really see uh, personalities of people coming through. We have um, an art director as well that's uh, a dad, loves techno music, mm -hmm. and the monopole chef. And we see these elements come together in the projects that people create. Um, also, when we're not able to add our ingredients into our client work, passion projects is a really big part of our culture. And passion projects help keep our corporate culture a lot, little less corporate and a lot more creative. Such as, I think we have uh, one of my favorites is uh, Omikuji, which was yeah, a new year that project. Was, that was great. So Omikuji machine is this. <laughs> and you might be wondering, what the hell is Omikuji? So Omikuji is basically a fortune-telling cookie minus the cookie, and this is something that we go purchase typically on New Year's in Japan at shrines and temples, and you know, we just check our fortune of the year. 
and you give you big luck, small luck, middle luck, sometimes really harsh. It's, it's really like, harsh luck. Too. Yeah, it's like, do not travel. <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. So our French art director, Melanie, she found this. She did omikuji for the first time. She was like, what the hell is this? This is amazing. And she was like, why haven't I seen this before? Like, I've never heard of this. So she thought that this would be, it would be amazing to be able to share this with the global community. So that's exactly what we did. We asked some of our animators to join us, collaborated, added a little goofy, quirky monopo touch to it, and then shared it with our global community for New Year's. Passion projects also help us to deliver messages on social issues that are close to us. Um, you know, there are, play, if, maybe if you have your awards goodie bags with you, if you dive Check into there, you'll see the Monopoly postcard. Yeah. Um, this is a project called Tap In, where we have combined traditional media um, illustration with, a, uh, with technology. So it's, if you download the app on the iOS store, you will see different messages appear on the postcards. So this is also, you know, perhaps Japan isn't always ready for some of the social issues that are dear to us, such as gender inequality. You're not really seeing this in marketing spaces, but Japan was ranked 121 on the gender gap last year. So we feel that these are passion projects are at least a way for us to express things that mean something to us. Um, so yeah, we care about people's interests. So we also make a space that people can share them. Um, we have, we decided, so we have, say, like, designers, developers, producers, and we kind of know exactly kind of what people do, but we wanted to know a little bit more. And so se Monopo Sessions is a way that we could share our, our skills with each other. I mean, I want to learn how to make a better deck. Um, and we have, like, uh, also invited external people that we really want to learn from. So, say, senpais in the community that we, you know, at Monopo want to kind of get mono information out of them. or the Monopo woman, we felt like we needed a defense, self-defense session, so don't mess with us. Um, mm -hmm. And had, uh, so these kind of sessions are our way of being able to learn a bit more and that kind of maybe fall outside the work that we do. Um, we also share one of our greatest assets, which as any business is not really something that you would do freely, but our community is one of our greatest assets in Monopo and something that, that does actually make us stand out a bit in the industry here. So uh, we have parties every month called Monopo Night. Um, it's not only an excuse to drink on a Friday, but also a way for us to get people together. And a lot of uh, creative newbies to the Tokyo scene would come and uh, you know, share ideas. Um, and also projects have happened and nothing to do with Monopo. People have collaborated and made their own thing and we're okay with that because we just really want to encourage creativity in the community. We also have uh, Creative by English, which is where we want to encourage people to study English, but in a fun and creative environment, talking about things that they actually care about, mm -hmm. and not that, you know, Sally met Harry on the bench. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we also have uh, various ways that we want to kind of share our interests with each other and learn more together. Um, and then once we have a community, we also, of course, these are the people that we work with in our client work, but we also want to give them a platform. So if it's either powered by Tokyo or something like the 360 art 365 art calendar, which just celebrates an artist a week for the last year. It was also a Google Chrome extension so that people didn't only have to have the hard copy, but also a way for those artists just to have, you, they could have whatever they wanted um, for a week, and people would be reminded of creativity every day on their desk, and a way for us to celebrate the creatives that we uh, include in our, in our community. So essentially, this constant focus on individual, on their interest, and sharing, 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 and trying to find some unique mix has been so beneficial for us. So let's recap. Crafting collective creativity is to give a shit about individuality. This is really important. You gotta know what you're mixing. You gotta know your ingredients. And set a stage for sharing. Don't be afraid. This is the time and the, the area where we really need to come together a bit more and create idea spaces. Where they're working virtually, you know, we work with London a lot, for example. We still need to come together and just chat it out. And then finally, grow a community of innovators. Because essentially, this is how Monopo, from two band boys from university, became a global agency of 30 people with a branch in London, with 10 different nationalities, with 50% of women. 
Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you ever feel like that your ingredient is maybe misunderstood, remember that it's 5 p.m. somewhere in the world, and someone's looking for a salty, spicy tomato drink too. So let's come pie to the future of creative cocktails, and we look forward to making one with you all soon. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.